If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 as your lead pastor. If you're not, you know that I'm both excited and saddened to be in the last part of our four-part series on one of my favorite books of the Bible, Philippians. Before we get started, I want to draw your attention to the screen behind me. That is from thebibleproject.com. Excellent resource. I've been encouraging you all to check out. If you haven't already downloaded our app, please do so. I'm encouraging you to do that. You can log on to our Wi-Fi for free. Download our app for free. It's a great resource. Search C3 Naples, and you will find all kinds of cool things there. You can get filled in on the sermons you may have missed. You can read scriptures, sermon notes, all kinds of cool things we've added to that app. Well, we are concluding this series on Philippians, and there's a whole lot that I could talk about in this fourth chapter, but I've already talked about so much because Philippians is one of my favorite books. I quote from it an awful lot. We've even done the out-of-context scripture thing, the famous Philippians 4.13, taking that out of context will get you punished here at C3. You have to wear the shirt of shame. <laughs> We don't wash it. You can't wash it. You have to wear it for a whole week if you take that verse out of context. That's how much it annoys me. No, I'm just kidding. Not a whole week, just three days. <clears throat> so <laughs> we are going to look at another verse that is commonly used out of context or maybe just stretched a little bit too far. But the overall focus today, appropriately, will be being like Jesus starting with Paul's example. Paul is the writer here of Philippians. So here's what he says in chapter 3. Philippians 3.17, Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. We find it again in Philippians 4.9. Do what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Now this isn't unique to the church in Philippi. He does it at other churches. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7. For you yourselves know how you must imitate us. We were not irresponsible among you. He's being like Jesus, teaching by example. So again, since we covered some of the other popular features of this letter, we're just going to kind of focus in on one verse today, and then I'm going to use like a bazillion to explain it to you. You thought you were getting off the hook there. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So that will bring us to anxiety. We're going to talk about anxiety this morning. Now, <clears throat> it's all in the same category. You'll notice maybe in your version it might have said concern or worries or cares or anxiety. What we're going to acknowledge this morning is that a lot of these words are in the same family. I don't want to get too technical this morning. So you can see angst, apprehension, willies. You can get the willies. <laughs> How do I insert that in? Would that be a good translation? Don't get the willies about anything. Um, don't get ants in your pants about anything. The heebie-jeebies, the jumps. That's kind of like old school, right? You've got to be hip to use that word. <clears throat> so we can do, <laughs> this is going to get bad, <laughs> we can do it in reverse. We can start with fear, and fear will also lead to anxiety, trepidation, a word I can't pronounce, chicken-heartedness. Wow, man. <laughs> well, we won't be putting those in the scriptures this morning. So we're going to talk about some of the differences, the causes, and responses today. But I don't want to be too technical. We're just going to kind of use them synonymously. They are synonyms. The Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard <laughs> defined anxiety as unfocused fear. I knew I shouldn't have used that name or the quote. Unfocused fear <clears throat> writes a lot about it. So there are types. We all have it to a certain degree. Often we pretend not to. And sometimes the cause can be selfish. I talked about this, getting out of our own heads a few weeks ago. And sometimes it can be genuine concern. But we as Christians struggle deeply with this because 
this next verse seems to be the standard. Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Always? Really? Can we really, really do that? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Rejoice always. This is what Paul wrote. But did Paul do that? So we're going to take a look this morning. Remember Epaphroditus. If you're coming in new to this or you're not familiar with Philippians, it was written as a thank you note right, to the Philippians. They send Epaphroditus with a gift for Paul. They send him back. Paul sends him back with this letter, presumably. But something happens in between. Epaphroditus gets really sick, so sick he almost dies. This is what Paul writes. Philippians 2, 28. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice when you see him again, and I may be less anxious. Huh. Not only this, but Paul had concern for all of the churches. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. Not to mention other things, there's daily pressure on me, my care for all the churches. That word care there, worry in Philippians 4, 6, are the same root word in Greek, marimna, meaning anxiety or concern. So if Paul had it, then we shouldn't legalize ourselves into being anxious about being anxious. You ever get that? Like, why am I anxious? I'm not supposed to be anxious, but I'm anxious. And then it goes in a vicious cycle, feeling guilty because we're anxious. If you're nervous about something, it doesn't always mean you are sinning. They aren't synonymous, and we're going to look at that. So don't beat yourself up in a vicious cycle, anxious about being anxious. The goal is not to be anxious. The rejoicing always could be hyperbole, but it is definitely the goal. Rejoice always. After that, it says pray without ceasing. Do we do that? Do we actually pray all the time? No. But it's the goal. Think about it. Imagine what it would look like if you prayed before everything you did. Your life might look a little bit different. The more I do this, the less mistakes I tend to make. Consult with God. We should do that before we act out on everything. Remember, in the first part of this Acts series, I give you a little bit of history, or the Philippians series. I took you to Acts because that's a history of the early church. And we looked at how Paul first arrived there. So I want to take a look back up a little bit further than that and just notice a few things with me. They're evangelizing through Europe, and this is what happens. Acts 16, starting at verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and they're prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in Asia. When they came to Mycenae, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So bypassing Mycenae, they came down to Troas. During the night, a vision appeared to Paul. A Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he'd seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to sail out from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to evangelize them. So they're letting the Lord lead. When we look at how this missionary group was chosen, we see that they start out in prayer by letting the Lord lead. We'll back up to Acts 13, starting at verse 1. In the church that was at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrenian, Menaean, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, that's Paul. <clears throat> As they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them to. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Notice how biblical missions works. They don't just all go. <laughs> hey, we're going. That's great. They pray. They fast. And then the Holy Spirit chose just two of them to go out for the work. He directs them as to where to go. Notice how they were prevented from going certain places. 
So they're following the Lord's lead. That's the point there. We find success when we pray before we do things. That's the key. Joy, definitely an ideal, definitely a goal. So in our focus verse about anxiety, Paul is echoing Jesus' teachings. Look at Matthew 6, 34, another verse you probably heard. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Interesting. But did Jesus experience anxiety? Do you remember his agony in the garden when we were in our Mark series? If you've read Mark or you've read the Gospels, you probably know this story. Just before he is betrayed and crucified, he goes off to the garden to pray. Clearly, he's not happy. Pastor Wayne referenced this in the last message. Mark 14, starting at verse 32. Then they came to a place named Gethsemane, and he told his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and horrified. Then he said to them, my soul is swallowed up in sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake. That doesn't happen. Then he went a little farther, fell to the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He's distressed and horrified. Sounds like he's pretty anxious, doesn't it? So anxious that he sweats blood. Look at Luke's account, Luke 23, starting at verse 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in anguish, he prayed more fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. That's actually a real thing. There's a medical term for that, hematohydrosis. It is a condition in which capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood, occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. Severe anxiety activates a sympathetic nervous system to invoke the stress fight or flight response to such a degree as to cause hemorrhage of the vessels supplying the sweat glands. It has been suggested that acute fear and extreme stress can cause this term. I'm not going to try to pronounce again. How did I do, Phil? <laughs> we, have, we have a doctor here named Phil. So we literally have Dr. Phil here. <laughs> I warned him I was going to do that. <laughs> Yes, hematohydrosis. You spend a lot of time practicing words when you're a pastor. It's part of the job. Jesus was under extreme stress. He's really, really anxious. We're told to pick up a cross and follow him. How can Jesus ask us not to be anxious about that when he himself was? It isn't a lack of faith. We're promised suffering. Jesus did not lack faith. He came in human form, so he gets us. We're going to take a look at what's going on here and the steps that we should take in dealing with it that we see from Jesus' example. So there are both natural and reverential types of anxiety which we experience as human beings. So we'll talk about them in a minute, but here we can see that sometimes it's a natural response. <laughs> like when someone jumps out around the corner and scares you. Did you jump? <clears throat> Those of you who've been with us for a long time know about our old building and how big it is. It's huge, 45,000 square feet. To give you an idea of how big that is, this is 17,000 square feet. So it's like about three times the size, right? Am I doing my math right? Huge, and it remained dormant most of the week. We didn't have NPAC with us, so it didn't have a bunch of people running around all the time. It was just this really creepy, dark, old building. Right? And so if you're working there by yourself during the week, it can be just like scary all by itself. Just being in the building can be just creepy, right? You know, it's like being in a mall all by yourself or like in a big old church. So 
Sometimes we'd be working there, maybe just two of us. And sometimes Carolee would be in the office, and she'd be going from the office, maybe to the kids' area, maybe to the copy room, and just kind of doing her thing. And my office was kind of on the other side of that really long hallway, and I'd be doing my thing, going to the worship center. I was the worship arts director at the time, and kind of just tooling around the building during the week doing what we had to do. And sometimes we would cross, cross paths. <laughs> and she would turn a corner, her sister's laughing, she would turn a corner not expecting to see a human being there. You know what I mean? You're in a dark building, you turn around, she's like, Ugh! you know what I mean? And I didn't have to do anything at all. I totally didn't mean it. So it happened so much, so much, so often, like every day, like every time we were working, that I told her, I thought of the uh, Seinfeld episode where they had the sidler. Those of you who are like my age will, will know this episode, right? So the person would sidle you, you know, at work, and I think Elaine like spilled her coffee on herself. She got so scared, you know, and so I said, they remedied that by getting him a box of Tic Tacs. So she got me a box of Tic Tacs. <laughs> <laughs> she really did. And I didn't use it. <laughs> I would forget and just go, you know, you get busy, you're doing things. I'd forget the Tic Tacs, and then maybe now, like, on purpose scared her, kind of, you know, so it would constantly happen. But, <laughs> but Carolee was not sinning by becoming frightened, right? It's not a sin. It was just she couldn't help it. She just experienced this fear. So there are, <laughs> there are causes of nature. <laughs> Mental conditions or emotional distress, as we talked about. An illness, perhaps. Just as there is physical illness, there's also mental illness. And it's not sin or because of sin. Take a look at John 9, starting at verse 1. As Jesus was passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. The man was born blind, not because he or anyone else sinned. It was so that God's glory could be shown through him. So God has the ability to turn your mess into a message, your test into a testimony. Believe in that. Then there are sinful types of anxiety that come from different things, like maybe being anxious because you've done something wrong and now you're afraid about being caught. That would be sinful anxiety. Or anxiety caused from a total lack of trust or faith in God. This type is not the type that Jesus was experiencing. But it is the type that we are told not to have in our key verse this morning. In context... Both Matthew and this verse in Philippians are about trusting God to provide for you. It's in the context of provision. This is the type of anxiety that we're told not to have. Jesus trusted the Father's provision. Not my will, but yours. He went to the cross knowing that he would rise from the dead. But again... I don't want you to get stuck in that cycle of beating yourself up, right? Being anxious about being anxious, being anxious about being anxious. There's some Christians who go around pretending like never to be worried about anything all the time. It's not helpful. It's not honest. It's not good for the person doing it. It's not good for the people observing it. Because then it leads to this, man, he's like really happy all the time. Maybe I should be happy all the time. What am I doing wrong? You know, not that you're supposed to go around crying about everything all the time either. You know, it's, it's a balance, right? And we've got to find that balance. But it's not being like Jesus if you're pretending that nothing's wrong all the time when something's wrong. It's not honest either. Jesus got angry. He wept. And he got anxious. It's okay. I was watching a film trailer on uh, this movie about Pavarotti. And you know Pavarotti is? He's a really great, great, great opera singer. And it surprised me to see they were talking about how nervous he got, like really, really nervous, not just like a little. They showed a clip of him walking down a hallway saying, I feel like I'm going to die. Like he would get so worked up before a performance that he felt like he was going to die. And I'm thinking, what is this guy worried about? He's like the best singer ever. You know, is he worried about like, oh, no, maybe today 
I won't be both totally and completely awesome at singing today, you know? Maybe I'll get up there and what's going to happen if I'm like just totally awesome? Or worse yet, just awesome at singing. Like, what's going to happen? Oh, I'm going to die, you know? I thought it was ridiculous. But it teaches us something. It doesn't matter how good you are at something. That's not where the anxiety comes from. We can't fool ourselves into thinking that we can work our way out of this. We've got to let God handle it. And so this is what we're going to look at. How do we deal with this? What are some steps? One, stop. Stop. Like whenever you're on fire, it doesn't help to like run around. You know, that happens all the time to us. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Just stop. It doesn't help. Stop. Check it out. Mark 6. Starting at verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. So they went out and did all these miracles, and they're excited about it. Pretty big deal. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a remote place and rest for a while. For many people were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. You ever get that busy? It'll make you anxious. Even if you don't know you're getting anxious, it'll wind you up. You have to stop. Next. Breathe. Just breathe. And identify where this is coming from. If it is from the enemy, causing unnecessary doubt and stress, keeping you from your plan in God, it's not good. If it's fear of the Lord, that's good. Philippians 2.12. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fear of the Lord is healthy. In Greek and Philippians, it's like our word phobia. It's really fear. I hear a lot of especially young people say, oh, well, I kind of think it's reverence. Well, I don't care what you think. It's fear. <laughs> Terror! Remember what happens every time an angel shows up? It's like, ah! You know what I mean? They're freaking out. You know what I mean? I, I would too. Fear. It's healthy. Fear of the Lord. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes there's reasonable concern, like Paul had for all the churches. I'll be honest. Sometimes I get really nervous as I prepare a message. Why? I'm handling God's Word. Think about that. I have a responsibility to get it right to all of you. So I have a fear of the Lord. I have a reasonable concern for all of you. I don't want to teach you this wrongly. That'll make you nervous. Look at James 3, verse 1. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. That doesn't sound like any fun. This is not a great career choice, i got to tell you. I knew that verse when Pastor Wayne was talking to me, and I'm like, listen, you know, I think I'm being called to becoming a pastor, and I started crying. He knew why. When I got ordained, people came up to me, congratulations. I'm like, what? Like, no, <laughs> no. The people who knew better were like, man, we'll be praying for your wife. You should have been doing that anyway. So if that doesn't cause a pastor or teacher to have at least a little healthy fear, he's not wise. That can cause some pretty serious anxiety. But here's the key. It doesn't stop me from preaching. It drives me. It makes me dig deeper, learn more, practice more. It makes me better at what I do. That's the key. That's a good type of anxiety or fear. It's respect for the Lord and all of you. Now, if it's crippling, not good. Stopping you from exercising your gifts, it's not good. So what do we do? We've stopped. We're breathing now. It's a good thing. We pray. That's what Jesus did. He went to a secluded place and he prayed. 
Luke 5, 15. But the news about him spread even more, and large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Yet he often, did you catch that? Often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Those of you who know me know that I take a Sabbath on Saturday. I don't think it's because I have to obey the law. No, it's not why. I think it's because, like, God came up with it, and it's probably a really good idea. That's why. I stop on Saturdays. Stop. It's important. Jesus needed a rest. <laughs> if he needed a rest, don't we? No, because some of us think we're God. <laughs> we're not. I take a rest. Stop. I encourage my staff. What's your day off? Take a day off. Stop. Breathe. Pray. It's very helpful. So we have that example as well in the garden, right? What did he do? How did he deal with it? He knows he's going to get crucified. Went off. Prayed. So the whole verse in Philippians 4 is about casting our cares on the Lord with prayer and supplication. So that's the key. The answer to the question that develops from the first part of the verse is in the latter half of the verse and continuing on to verse 7. So if we break it apart like that, Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Look at Matthew 6, 34 again. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Why? Back up. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Provision. Focus on Jesus. Seek his kingdom and his provision, even if it is ultimately the provision of eternal life. So the key to our joy is found through prayer. Remember, rejoice always. What's the next line? Pray constantly. Pray without ceasing. So as we bring the series to a close, Be Like Jesus, let's look at this text. Let's meditate on this here. Philippians 3, starting at verse 17. Join in imitating me, brothers, and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. Be like them as they are being like Jesus. For I've often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. They're focused on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. How powerful is that? He's God. Subject everything to himself. Don't be focused on earthly things that cause anxiety, but on heavenly things as we wait for Jesus. Reach out. Focus on the prize. Passing through life's problems to our heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen.